Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF627 EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-94248. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewellery? Do you want to pick up a hobby but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewellery Workshops. Veil Jewellery Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewellery. They will help you make a range of silverware including rings, bracelets and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills such as soldering, texturing, shaping and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewellery and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789794248. Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Reese Deans of Creative Space Podcast and I am your host truly. On this episode today, we have none other than John Strasberg. John Strasberg is a writer, actor, teacher. He is a uh, d- d- director. He's, he's been there and done that. And he's also the son of the famous uh, teacher, drama teacher, a uh, theatre practitioner, he is the son of Lee Strasberg, who was nominated for an Oscar for his performance as Hyman Roth in The Godfather Part 2. He's also the father of method acting Lee Strasberg. So we talk a lot about uh, John Strasberg's father, about uh, his legacy, but we also talk about John Strasberg and how he approaches the drama, how he approaches teaching his class, what he uh, takes from the teachers that have taught him and what he has learned over the years. I mean, we we, we go through a lot. And we also talk about the SAG-AFTRA and the WGA uh, strikes that are happening in, in America, in Hollywood. Uh, we, we go through a lot. And there's, there's a lot that I've learned from him. Because one of the things that I... One of the reasons why I wanted John Strasberg to come on the podcast is because I wanted to pick his brains. I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to learn from the best because obviously he's the son of one of the i think greatest minds in american theater and i just wanted to pick his brains and see what he thinks about drama he thinks about acting and and life itself so without further ado it's me and john strasberg on creative space podcast do you know what I think, I do believe, I even know, do you know when people research, they, they think they know, but they don't know, because you get caught out just like mm-hmm. that. So if I get caught out, the one thing I always wanted to learn, I always want to learn, it's not about what I know, it's what I want to learn, and mm-hmm. what is the basics. But I yeah, I, I, I think the, the first thing I want to know is, what is the, what are the pros and cons of drama in your opinion? The pros and cons i don't even understand why you would ask a question like that <laughs> i think that any civilization is fundamentally defined by the arts that's what we remember mm. we don't 
remember the wars too much. You know, history books remember the wars and remember generals and, you know, because most history books are celebrating power as opposed to celebrating love. But in the long run, a society is going to be defined by its art and not by other things. Mm. So to me, uh, even though that everybody, even people in the theater thinks that theater is dying or this or that, or, you know, what's the point? Um, I think that that comes because it gets very confused with the entertainment industry. And, and when you grow up and when you're living in the world, it's something you want to deal with. I mean, everybody want, want you know, the Americans want to go to Hollywood. They want to make the money. Um, but I have had friends, well, they're, they're all dying off, but uh, uh, who were making a lot of money and were fundamentally unhappy because they were not doing what they dreamt they wanted to do when they began hmm. you know, and and uh, for better or worse you know with whatever faults I have um, I've always been dedicated I, I'm not going to call myself an artist I, I, because too many people you know don't do anything and say what are you I'm an artist you know I, I think I work hard um, but certainly I I understand that theater can occasionally be an art form, whether it's practiced individually, which most of the time is is how it's done, uh, or occasionally in a company or in a group or a production, mm. you know, which rises to the level of of an art form. Yeah. You know? mm. So going back, so we're going back to the when you were growing up with your childhood, and especially your father being Lee Strasberg. What was it like growing up to have a father like Lee Strasberg, and especially how much theater was part of your life? Well, at not that having time. had another father, it's hard for me to make a comparison. Mm. <laughs> you know, but uh, certainly when I was a kid, uh, I didn't like the theater because I thought my parents preferred it to me. Um, and, and therefore, theater, what that means is that theater was the main topic of conversation you know we would sometimes sit around and watch my father loved sports so we we shared that uh, a little bit but any serious conversation was not about life it was about the theater and about art and it's you know relationship to life and things like that and i i didn't like that when i was a kid you know i was looking for a you know, can't we just have a life and, and what do you really like? And, you know, what was your life like and things like that. And any personal questions were fundamentally never really dealt with. Uh, and, and that bothered me for a long time. And I think it did affect my work as I, as I matured and as I, because obviously I didn't, if I didn't like the theater, it was like, how did I end up in it? You know, and, mm -hmm. um, and my sister uh, said that uh, we choose our families. She was that kind of person. And I said, Susan, I would never have chosen this family, you know, so. And, and I still can't tell you whether exactly why I ended up in the theater because i'm not sure that i did it out of some obviously i have a deep passion and love for it but in the beginning i'm not sure whether i did it because of that or because i thought that it was the only way that i might get the love from my family that i wanted mm. and uh yeah, I admire people who say, oh, yes, when I was three or four, I know I, I've always known that I wanted to be in the theater and things like that. And, you know, I'm I'm not one of them. I was in the theater my my entire life. Uh, but I it's not something that I originally thought I chose mm -hmm. at when I was in my 20s. I finally decided that I wanted to find find out what I really thought about myself and about my work. Mm. And my work went through enormous transitions at that point because I had been trained by my father 
and he was a, a great teacher. Uh, and the work that he taught works. It's very powerful. And it was based in sense memory training. If I if you if I'm going on too much and you want to ask specific things, stop me and 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 uh, no no by all means carry on. <laughs> uh, and uh, is extremely powerful. But when I did what I really wanted to do, I wasn't doing anything that I was taught. Something would happen. Fundamentally, I would be inspired. And when that happened to me, which happened twice in the first year, I was 19 years old uh, in two different scenes. <clears throat> and unconsciously, it was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And I think my entire life, in terms of my career, my work is, is dedicated and based on those two moments of inspiration in which <laughs> and so as my work evolved it was like i realized that for instance my father's work which is extremely powerful but there was something i didn't like and what i didn't like was the sense that i was planning what i was going to feel on the next page and when i was inspired i wasn't doing that i was living in the moment and i wanted to be able to live in the moment in another world as somebody else. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like myself. So when I acted, it was almost a relief for me because I could, I mean, it was me, but it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And I was able to express myself in a way that I couldn't express myself in life. And I think I learned when I was young, I learned more about life when I was acting than in life. After a while, that began to balance itself out. And when I teach and when I work, very often I'm not talking about the technique. I'm, I'm talking about life. Mm. Because I think that that's what's interesting. You know, and the technique is only going to help you to express yeah. something that you're perceiving about life. Mm. The one thing I've always wanted to ask you this, and it's been... Going around, uh, it, it was there's there's many actors who we always talk about method acting. We always talk about the method from how Stanislavski started it off, and then uh, your, your father uh, uh, built around it techniques, and then you have other um, practitioners and etc. But I've always wanted to know: Do you think method acting? has been abused recently because the way the reason why i asked this question is because i was just i was reading up an article and they're saying that uh, method acting is is uh somewhat you know you get jared leto doing over the top antics you know when he was do playing the joker in the suicide squad and he was doing uh what many people believe to be uh, absurd things you know sending rats to co-stars you know and and etc and then there's people who like Daniel Day Lewis for example he absor he became becomes the character he 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 wants mm -hmm. to know the ins and outs of oneself and there's mm -hmm. there's the harmfulness so in, in your opinion what is your opinion on method acting especially in today's time well, I think it's probably extremely misunderstood and, mm -hmm. and people lump everything together. Um, my father didn't like the expression, although he never really resisted that people used it. Uh, and of course, if you talk to Stella Adler, uh, she would have said that she detested him and, uh, and, and would also claim that she was teaching Stanislavski's work. So... It depends on who you ask as to what it is. And when you talk about method acting, it depends on what you're really asking about. Mm. Uh, to me, what defines the best acting, I don't care what you want to call it, is how deeply personal it is. Mm. And the sense of something being deeply personal, as opposed to, you know, like in the United States nowadays, with the universities, which have taken over power in terms of training, uh, you know, where you have young people that by the time they get a diploma, they owe the bank a quarter of a million dollars. And you kind of go, how are they going to have a career? You know, you, you have to pay the bank, 
you know, and if you're a starving actor, how are you going to, how do you do this? Uh, and I think it's a terrible problem. And unfortunately, in, in, uh, some people think the acting is better than it was. Uh, I'm not one of them. I think that the acting is technically very good, uh, but it tends to be like white bread. In other words, it has no flavor. There is nothing deeply personal. And that's what I think really defined what I call a movement in, in American theater. There was a movement. And that movement came goes back to the 30s and goes back to the group theater. All of them, Stella, my father, founded it. But Stella, Sandy Meisner, any of the teachers came out of the group. The Kazan comes out of the group theater. Um, and I think that the Actors Studio was a, a, an artistic movement. And it was not a school. It was a studio where artists practice. Uh, most of the people who got into the studio who are successful because the majority of them are un totally unknown um, had studied with somebody else. They'd studied with my father, so studied with Stella. They didn't come to the act studio as beginners and go through a program of learning. That's not how it functioned. Uh, and I think it's tremendously misunderstood. But when you talk about something being deeply personal, for you talk about what Jared Leto does, I just think that that's an asshole. You know, I think he's a <laughs> jerk, you know, and, and if he did that to me, I would probably try to take the rat and stuff it down his throat and say, here's reality for you, you know? Mm. Uh, uh, so I think that that's to, to lump that together with deeply serious artistic desires to be deeply personal and to not necessarily consciously express what you know about life, but in your work that comes into it, I think that's part of any art, any art form, any artist is doing that. So the fact that it gets singled out in acting is very strange to me. What, what bothers people about something being deeply personal? What bothers people about wanting to know yourself? Why is that attacked when it comes to acting and talked about as being neurotic when it's the foundation of human life? Any great teachers from Christ or Buddha, you know, know yourself. That's what they say. Mm. So what's the problem? Why yeah. is that bothering people? And the only reason I think it bothers people is out of their own fear of life. And I believe that I, 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 not just that I believe, I know I'm right. And I know that all the theories of acting are based on that fear of life. And they want to distance themselves. The major school of acting is not the realistic school. I don't call it the method. I call it more the realistic school. Um, and of course, the tick in the realistic school is the kind of naturalistic acting that you see in television most of the time. You can see it in the movies, too, mm. uh, as opposed to something that goes beyond that, where there's a deeper involvement, there's a deeper personal involvement, and it's very hard to define. It's like trying to define love. Uh, you know, Shakespeare did it better than any of us. Uh, and that is what I think is actually going on, mm. whether it's conscious or not. And that, I think, is is true of any art form any art form where they said to you don't get involved people would look at you and say well, what's the point why so you know the method gets attacked sometimes it was you know uh self-indulgent it in the 60s you know it led to you know, some actors thinking well but this is how I feel. And you go, yeah, but the character doesn't get angry that way. But this is how I get angry. And you go, wait a minute, you know, it's not just about you. It's about you in the character's world. Mm. And I think that that becomes confusing. And then, and people will pick on anything that they don't like to try to erase what's making them uncomfortable. What's making them uncomfortable is that something is more personal and has more feeling in it. And people don't like it. 
including people in the profession who mm-hmm. don't like it. It's disturbing. Like life bothers me. And I'm going, well, have you found something better? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and I think that it's a, a, a very great misunderstanding. Some of it in the, in the 40s and the 50s when the actor's studio was at its height, uh, it came out of jealousy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, it was the only opportunity the United States has ever had to have a national theater. Uh, it had a body of actors. It had people ready. And unfortunately, when we got into the beginning of the 60s, uh, Kazan, who was invited to form Lincoln Center, didn't want my father, uh, who had been his teacher. Mm. And he didn't want the competition. He didn't want to feel, you know, which I think is right. You know, he was a famous director. He didn't want to mm. share the power. Um, but and therefore the actor studio theater formed a theater which only lasted three years um and that was the only opportunity america's had i think americans have a, a terrible difficulty in collaborating <laughs> you know, everybody has to be number one yeah. yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna quickly yeah. run through yeah, yeah i'm gonna quickly run through some names for you right just to get it out of the way and some of these are always oh the famous names and you've already mentioned uh kazan anyway but you probably uh, you probably get these names asked a lot so if you want to say move on from that name that's fine with me um but i got number one marlon brando well marlon is the one who brought it to the public it's mm-hmm. the only time that i know of where an artistic process became interesting to the public mm-hmm. it became a public you know commodity in a way and that was really, you know, I mean, one of my favorite actors is Montgomery Clift, who actually, oh. you know, comes before, you know, he's a little bit before Marlon, but they were contemporaries. And those two just revolutionized acting in the world. Yeah. It's not that they weren't good actors before, but there was something that was deeply personal, which was different. And that's what nobody really clarifies. Yeah. I you, think I, I really understand. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think um do you think Brando was a tragic character in some ways? Yeah. Yeah. I wish he had played King Lear instead of living it. Mm. Yeah. The another name uh, just mentioned as well is uh, Al Pacino. Yeah, Al Al was a very good uh shortstop. <laughs> and you know in some of the films is wonderful you know yeah, yeah. some of his work is fantastic some of it's a little, a little over the top but yeah you know, but no, nobody's perfect and and uh uh you know he certainly has to be held up there i think the most talented of my generation was uh, uh bobby de niro I was going to say Robert De Niro was up, up yeah, there as well. I think he had the most intuitive process of, mm. of people I know. He does too many gangsters, you know, so after a while you kind of go, yeah, come on. But when he's good, he's good. Mm. It's, uh, uh, it's like in France, uh, Gerard Depardieu, you know, mm. when he's good, he's absolutely wonderful, you know. And other times you just go, Jesus, because he needs the money. You know, so. <laughs> One of, another name, because uh, obviously they've got the they released the trailer for the the the, the second uh, Exorcist film, and it's Ellen Burstyn. Burstyn or Burstyn? I always get the, the Burstyn, last thing. Yeah, yeah, Burstyn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, Ellen I'll, is one of the major uh, um, acolyte is not the word, you know, but uh, one of the people who really sat at my father's feet and and is representative of of the principle of work in the mm. studio. Uh, another one as well is uh, Carl Malden, who I think, in my opinion, is should be celebrated more as an actor. Um, well, Carl, it's another studio actor. You know, yeah. these are all New York actors that in that period, you know, and they're, they're, they all uh, have this, it was almost ingrained 
Mm-hmm. You know, the, and nowadays you don't see it that much. A lot of people talk about the method, but it becomes a thing about expressing emotion and it doesn't go into the how personal it is. It gets correct and correct thinking. And I think there are very few people who can actually teach what uh, the essence of the work is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like kind of going to the Beaux-Arts. You know, you can learn the technique, but it doesn't... So you can paint. It doesn't mean you're a painter. You know? Yeah. Moving on for so the, moving on for the names now. I just want to know about your approach to 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 drama to acting, because we've we've heard you know we can always research about Stanislavski. We can always research about Brecht. We can always research about Arto. Um, we can always research about many many practitioners and and say oh this is the, this is approach this is what you should do or this is what you can do etc cetera, etc cetera. but for you how do you when you go into a class and say there's about 15 students that say we want to be actors how do you approach them and say well this is how you approach drama this is how you approach the acting well i guess probably one of the things i'd say is if you if there's something else you think you could do do it because this is something that only if it's the only thing you want to do, then do it. And then my my advice is never give up. Mm. Because I don't have a thing about that if you're not a great actor, give it up. You know, I, I mean, you one has to strive to be the best that you can be. But not everybody has the same levels of talent. Not everyone is as intelligent. Not a, you know, we're, we're born with different capacities. And... Uh, uh, when I was a kid, uh, there was a guy at the actor's studio, a guy named Michael Conrad, who ended up doing a series and movies and things in television. And he was a, a really sweet guy who had been blacklisted. Uh, and I don't know why, I, I never knew why anybody liked me, <laughs> but, uh, he liked me and I and one day he was talking to me at the studio and he said, you know, Johnny, I know I'm not a good actor. He said, but I just love it so much. There's nothing else that I want to do. I have never in my life heard a bad actor talk like that. Most of the bad actors think that they're great. And most of the really wonderful actors have doubts. So I recommend that one has doubts. <laughs> um, but I think the most important thing is that you never give up. Mm. And in terms of, you know, my teaching is very individual and it's very personal. You know, I'm not teaching a group. I'm dealing, you know, I may have 15 people, but there's 15 people. Mm. And, and I'm going to try to see... In other words, I don't start by saying you can't do scene work. You have to do technique for a year or things like that. So you want to act, act. Mm -hmm. And I go from there because I actually, uh, in other words, I teach technique backwards in the sense, or I think I teach it correctly, but get up, try to do something. When you fail, you're going to realize that there are things you need to learn. And once you know that there are things that you need to learn, you're going to want to learn it. And you'll learn it much faster than if someone tells you, you have to do this. Mm-hmm. And I work that way. And I believe honestly, uh, and I've worked in a lot of different countries on very high levels as a director and and and, uh, and a teacher. And I... I uh, I believe that I can train somebody faster and cheaper than any school that I know of. You know, I, I can't talk about national schools that are subventioned because it's that's tax money that's paying for it. So you can't really tell how much it costs. Uh, but in terms of private education, yeah, I, I, I think I'm very good at what I do. Uh, but I'm dealing with the individual. And I even now in New York, sometimes I have people we've worked together. We, you know, I've had several theaters and I've had people that have worked in those theaters. And 
and they'll still come to work with me in, in classes. And, and this is an atmosphere I remember at the studio where you had Paul Newman and you had, you know, Jerry Page. And these are people who were already, you know, known and whatever, coming into class and work. Hal, who would come in and work, uh, you know, later, you know, things like that. There was a certain need and uh, and a humility in, in to one sense that that I was raised in and that I think is just part of what a work process is. So all of the other stuff to me is just, you know, a, a lot of narcissistic uh, masturbation, to be honest. When you were going on to the, just staying on to the topics of uh, teaching, you were <laughs> teaching at uh, Columbia Pictures for from 1966 to 1968, if I'm right in saying so. And it's around about the time that Columbia Pictures was thinking of merging with um screen gems so there was that talk of but it was no it was the period in which television became more important than movies economically mm. desi lu that that was really desi lu uh, yeah. who's you know lucy uh lucille ball and desi mm. Arnaz, that, that were actually you know her more than him in turn and and that was i was there just in the moment when it, economically it flipped, it mm. flipped over, you know, and, so, and uh, yeah, go ahead. No, it was, it was just going to say that obviously the, um, there was like a, a merge where Columbia Pictures became Columbia Pictures Corporation because Scream Gem merged with them. And uh, there was like millions of dollars in talk, but you were teaching acting at Columbia Pictures. So I just wanted to know what was that experience like for you? And well, there they anyone... were the last contract people that, that existed. <laughs> um, it was the it was the end of it. It was the end of Hollywood in 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 the in the sense of what had been going on from the twenties and thirties. Uh, <laughs> and I had a group of people uh, who were terrified to work because they were afraid that the producers might find out that they didn't really know how to act. Uh, the only one who had any willingness to work was Harrison Ford. And of course, he's the only one that we know know about. You know, and, and he was going through a period, he was married, you know, and he was going through a period where he said, I might have to leave the profession. You know, I don't know if I can, because I don't know I can support my family. And, you know, the normal things that go on in, if one wants acting, which to me is not a profession, you know, I think acting is a way of life. And uh, uh, anyone who looks at it simply as a profession, you know, it's uh, how can you do that when the majority of actors are unemployed? You know, it's you can't look at it that way. Mm. How do you look at it from, in, especially in today's time where? We're seeing the Screen Actors Guild, uh, the SAG and AFTRA, and the, the the Writers Guild in America striking against uh, these corporations. How do you uh, view well, that? Uh, well, it, it it has to happen. I mean, they're making a fortune, and and you have to share it out. That's what democracy is: is sharing money. <laughs> you share it out. You know, there's still going to be millionaires and billionaires. You know, the, the problem in, in Hollywood right now, right now, I mean, for the last period of time, in the early days, these guys, whatever they, you know, they may not be nice people, whatever, but they did love movies. Mm. Now they don't care about the movie. They're all lawyers. They're just, they're there. They're looking at the bottom line and that's all they're looking at. They don't want to look at it, something, you can't present a script if it's not, budgeted for 10 15 million dollars and even that they may say it's too cheap they don't mm. want to be bought you know so it's a whole other world and they're making a fortune yeah and now of course streaming is replacing cable cable replaced television television replaced movies so we're in another moment uh where there are these major changes going on in, in which they're taking advantage of the fact that there isn't a contract in which someone 
when where you have something on streaming, uh, they're not getting, you know, the 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 artists are not getting their money. You know, so there's a strike, you know, it has to happen, you know, and, and uh, they're arrogant enough to think that, that what will happen is uh, there was one executive that said something like, uh, well, we'll just wait until they, you know, they, they can't pay their rent. Yeah. You know, that's the attitude, you know, that they can break them down and, um, yeah, that's, it's, you know, and if this is, this is who you have to do business with, thank God that the unions are, are strong enough to actually, that's the only purpose of a union. It's the mm -hmm. only reason you need them is because you have greedy people. You know, How if you yeah. have greedy people, you wouldn't need the union. You know? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, how important is it right now that theatre? How important is it theatre right now in this position? Because you've got people going on strike, the SAG after and uh, the WGA, etc. But how how important is theatre at this moment in time now when everything is going on? Uh, well, maybe for some actors it may be important. You know, in terms of the business, I don't think it will have that much effect on the business. Uh, you know, people, you know, it's like every time that there is, you know, like in 2008, you know, we had a depression, the markets collapsed and all that. People are talking about a depression. And I laugh because I think theater is always in a depression, you know, so <laughs> this is normal. Welcome to the club, you know? Yeah. You know, if you go into the theater because you think you're going to make a living, you're in the wrong place, you know? you. And now for in New York, I, I had a, a theater company that still exists, you know, and, and going back several years, you know, we, we raised a little bit of money. I raised money um, and we did three productions, uh, but we were limited to doing like 16 performances. And uh, we didn't, it's, they were the, I know how good the productions were. I know what they are. You know, it's my business to know this. I work in several countries. I have to know whether my work, uh, what level my work is on. Uh, but, you know, it was like throwing money in the toilet. And now I, I don't want to do theater in New York because I don't think it's worth it. I made a movie in, in 2015 based on a play that we had done that I had written. Uh, so for me, it was, it's been, you know, having that season in the theater was was extremely important to me. And uh, I think that theater exists because <laughs> actors need to do it. And I think the healthiest is the are the English. I think they have the healthiest environment. And that's why there are so many good actors that come out of it. Uh, there's a period in the States where that was going on. And there was a period in the States that kind of reignited English theater. When you go back into the 50s, you know, where you had Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller, you know, and it's Arthur Miller who fundamentally, you know, convinced Olivier that he had to produce, you know, look back in anger. Olivier didn't want to do it because it was had a lower class hero. You know, and, you know, the, you know, you had to have an, you know, a, a, an upper class accent to be on the stage. Mm. Uh, and that was all turned around. You know, it's, you know, uh, uh, Albert Finney and, and Peter O'Toole, you know, who were the first two to do any kind of classical material without a perfect accent. You know, mm. now there's all kinds of experimentation going on. And with cross casting, with all you know, which is sometimes very confusing. You know, you're watching a something in in 1650, and you can't tell, you know, or, or Macbeth is a woman, and you're kind of going, well, well, wait a minute, it takes five minutes to figure out. Oh, that's Macbeth. Oh, that's who, you know, because because of all the stuff that we're going through, which is politically correct. I don't know artistically if I always like it but I'm certainly not going to be able to change the world, you know, but um, I guess things have to change, but I hope it changes for the better and doesn't just become a kind of political instrument. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that theater is a political instrument. 
Mm. I don't. I, yeah. I th- personally, I think that the most political play that I know is Romeo and Juliet. Because I mm. think that if people believe that love was the most important thing in life, they would change the world. Yeah. I don't think there's anything more political than that. Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF627EB, or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk, or maybe just give them a call at O double seven eight nine nine four two four eight. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film, or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So, do you want to have experience in making jewelry? Do you want to pick up a hobby? But do not know what to take or where to start, then look no further than the Veil Jewelry Workshops. Veil Jewelry Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewelry. They will help you make a range of silverware, including rings, bracelets, and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills, such as soldering, texturing, shaping, and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewelry, and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewelryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewelryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789794248 do, do you do you um do you dislike it when people when playwrights say oh this is this is a political play what they've written do you hate it when they say this is a political play because sometimes I just think it's like my my fiance would always say to me, um, because I, I mean I'm I'm a playwright myself, but she always says in order to get it out there, you need to write a political play, and I'm just thinking, shouldn't always be. Well, you know, Chekhov was was brutally attacked because he wouldn't take a point of view. Mm. Well, I only wish that writers were as bad as Chekhov was. Because he didn't write political plays. No. And yet, and yet what he was revealing in terms of human experience and human life is much more interesting than any political play I know of. So I very often, and that's just all from my point of view, bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit which encourages mediocrity mm. because, because the producers or the people who are giving money are idiots who don't know anything and therefore you have to write a political play and i just think that that's just very sad i think it's a very sick environment and uh, uh, i have enough enemies without saying that but you know i don't know someone has to say it oh yeah someone has to talk maybe you save one young person who 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 doesn't give in to that and say, you know, in, in the States, one of the problems is not that. The big problem in the States is movies. A writer makes much more movie money working in movies and television. And therefore, you know, you don't have the same level of, of uh, development, you know, uh, that you do have if someone is going to write a play. It's a different experience to write a play than it is to write a movie script or a television show. I'm I'm all for making money. But I think the point of making money, if you make it, it'll make you, you can live better, but it also may give you the opportunity to do what you really want to do. So what is it that you really want to do? 
and writers, all the great, you know, theater writers are fundamentally poets in disguise, you know, and, and poetry and language defines a culture. And that's what theater is to me. You know, a lot of the modern stuff that's like, you know, kind of different kinds of production, you know, the, I, 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 it all gets lumped under theater. But to me, theater is the art of the spoken word. Not the, not just the written word, the spoken word. Mm. Does you anyone know, stand, yeah. Absolutely but, beautiful, you know, anyway. No, sorry. D does anyone stand up for you today? as like a proper actor's actor, you know, is anyone on the stage or in film that you think to yourself, that is, that is the oh, actor that. There, there, I think there are, there are quite a few, you know, uh, Michael Gambon is, is one of the few people that I went to the theater when we were in London, when, when I could afford to go. Um, <laughs> and uh, I saw him in two plays. And in the second one, it took me about, five minutes before I realized it was him and and it's hard to fool me yeah and I was going well there's an actor that's a guy who's an actor you know I mean there's a lot of I think wonderful actors mm -hmm. you know Ian McKellen I saw Ian McKellen do uh, Waiting for Godot in, in New York with uh, Patrick Stewart uh, and their friends and you could tell on stage mm -hmm. there was just an energy on stage that was, you know, just a real play when you watch someone that's skillful, you know, uh, um, you know, certainly, I mean, they're, you know, of, of the Americans, you know, unfortunately, most of the Americans don't work that much in theater at the moment, you know, so it's, it's, uh, and, and that's very sad to me, you know, yeah. Dustin did a little, you know, Al has done a little. You know, but it's not, you know, with the English, it's much more, you know, Tony Hopkins, you know, who I knew a little bit when he couldn't get a job and he was living in New York. Yeah. You know, Hello, and, Welshman. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and uh, uh, also he was very much into, uh, if you call method, uh, mm. you know, because he he worked at the uh, the drama center uh, in, in London, which I think now it's Giles Foreman, I think has his own... Uh, his own uh, uh, school, uh, but they were the closest to uh, realistic work mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Uh, um, um, and uh, uh, I'm blind. I'm half on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I my, know head, my head just drifts away for <laughs> a while. Whatever. <laughs> No, it's okay. I think the the closest one, just supporting what you're saying, I think the closest one I've ever seen, I mean, this is going back a few years ago, 2019, I think it was. Um, I went to London to watch uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and Christian Slater was playing the character uh, Richard Roma. And I thought, you know, Christian Slater, we all remember him from True Romance. We remember him from some some great movies, some bad movies, whatever people's taste are. But I just thought he played... Ricky Roma because it's such a strong character I think anyway um, he became Richard Roma just as soon hmm. as he walked into the room and it was yeah, just I don't, know, I don't know him that way you know no. so, you know uh, half the you know Kevin Spacey did the same thing they, they go to London yeah because because they, they you know it's it's a it's an environment you know if you if you do that in New York the pressure with the critics and with all this kind of stuff and the money and uh, is, is just a terrible, <laughs> there's not an environment that now is encourages theater, just theater, mm -hmm. theater, you know, it's a, yeah. it's all, it's just terribly expensive and, and uh, there's, you know, it's just not the best period, you know, for, for American theater. Yeah. It's <clears throat> especially in um, in the UK as well because there was a a play that was it was it was called Good and uh Scottish actor David Tennant played the the main protagonist and they were having a look at um we were having a look at tickets and the most cheapest seats go in in London to go and watch that play was eighty five pounds and we were just and the, the best seats were 
over over 150 and we just sat and me and my friends just sat there and thinking is this what theater is coming to well just... that, you know that that's a normal price the 150 would be like a near 200 dollars is almost a normal price in new york uh, i won't i won't go I'm, uh, it's, it's just you know it, it just it's infuriating and you know if that was really filtering down and making if 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 the theater was healthier and was doing better, we could complain about it. Yeah. That's not what happens, you know, and then you have, so even the audiences have absolutely no education in terms of what they're seeing. Half of them are tur in New York, it's tourists or companies that give tickets to people, you know, and they're now, they can, they can have alcohol during the performance. You know, it's, it's a kind of environment that is, you know, it's just, it's all about the money. Yeah. And not about the experience, you know. So. Yeah. That, that's where it's, 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 it's exactly the same as going in the UK now, I think, um, because. That's sad. It, yeah, yeah that's it sad. is. Because there's, there's a sense of gravitas in British theatre where, you know, there's a, we always talk about, I mean, with plays, I mean, I haven't seen a play in, in the British theatre for a while, but I've seen some musicals and there there was one incident that happened months and months ago and i don't know if you heard about it but there was an incident that happened in a manchester theater where the bodyguard musical was playing and the there was a few audience members that were trying to oversing the the lead actress for the from the song i will always love you and i just think to myself you you've paid your money don't try and give reasons to participate when you paid your money. You've come to watch a theater show. The people that have worked their asses off. Mm. Why? Why do you want to do that? And no, no, that's that's a that's a modern thing that's going on. Yeah. yeah, I can understand from a pantomime's perspective, a British pantomime's perspective, because it's encouraging and it's not taken seriously. That's absolutely fine, but it's like. Um, we, me and uh, my friend Pippa, who's a, a co-host of mine, she always she asked me this question, and I was left uh, stumped. Was do you permit alcohol in the theaters? Do you, or do you just want to stop it? And I just think, well, I don't, I don't particularly know because, to be honest, with you, I don't own a theater. I'm, I'm not in the, uh, I'm not that much of a professional. Well, there yeah, is no know. success. There is in the history of theater. If there's ever been a successful theater that didn't have a bar. But that's mm. where the actors go and hang out and the director yeah. and talk and things like that. During the play, I guess in Shakespeare's time, obviously there was a whole, it was a, it was a, a very much more open, chaotic kind of situation. Um, and maybe there's something, but that would only, that would function well if people understood where they were. And I think nowadays people are out of contact. Everything is virtual. It's all like they're watching television, or it's a theater game, and you know, or and and people just I don't think they know where they are, and mm. I don't know how to. I think it's a serious problem, not just in the theater. I think the theater may manifest it because it's a it's a you know when when I was younger, New York audiences. You had a gam of middle class and working class people that could go that wanted to go to the theater. You know, now those people, if they want to go to the theater, even if you go off Broadway, the tickets are expensive. Mm. You know, and 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 so it's made it very very hard for people. I've tried in some of the. You know, some of the companies. You know, where, where you do a subscription, so you get a price in a year and things like that and, and and that's possible but still you're only you're going to get a middle class audience you're not going to get just someone who is interested and wants to go see a play you know it's mm -hmm. it's you know I, I don't know how to solve that I, I don't know what to do you know it's a we're living in a very chaotic period of time and we're we're, we're all, I, I think theater will survive in the way I think that the planet will survive. I don't know that I really believe in global warming, 
you know, because I've read enough history books to know that there are periods in history where things turn into a desert for years and then it changes back and, you know, because nature is like that. So I'm not prepared to say we're on, you know, death, you know, because we're controlling nature and we're destroying nature. I'm not really prepared to do that, you know, but anyway, you know, we're living in that kind of period. Mm. Yeah. Just going quick, yeah, going quickly back um, onto, I've always wanted to know from your perspective, and it's the last couple of questions. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and have a chat. I've been having so much fun doing this. <laughs> um, just want to know always, I, I, I recently watched a, a documentary about Stella Adler. And there was, uh, and obviously there was, uh, put it uh, rightly, tension between your father and Stella Adler. I've always wanted to know, what was the relationship between yourself and Stella Adler, did was there always a, a respect going on? Because well, for, for me, uh, I didn't have a relationship with her because that was kind of like forbidden fruit. Mm. Personally, I think she probably would have adored me. You know, I was good looking when I was younger, and I was sensitive when I was younger, <laughs> um, and and I think that 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 I and I think that. Uh, the way that I think about acting. You know, if I put myself somewhere, I think I'm the next generation. So I, uh, you know, I, I think I combine the best of all of them. And I think that I go back in a way to the roots of Stanislavski, who, you know, I, in other words, to me, uh, I start from the play, you know, and I'm starting from, uh, you know, to me, script analysis and involvement in the script. You know, and all the techniques are secondary to that uh, because I want to lose myself in an imaginary world. That's what I want to do. Mm. And so I do think that that's what Stella's spirit was closer to. But uh, she hated him. Um, she said that he ruined her pleasure. And he said that she was self-indulgent, you know, and, and uh, it was like a family. I mean, yeah. it, it's a family in, in the the best and worst sense of the word. You know, mm -hmm. part of that is the wonderful thing that it all came out of the group theater, you know, and, and but I also think that they were destructive to more than one generation of actors <laughs> because they they tried to say that what they were teaching was the best uh, uh, technique. And I think that that obscures the reality that it's the human being that's the most important thing. And the technique is subservient to the human being, as opposed to, if you learn this technique, you can be a great actor. Mm. The idea of that is just extremely self-destructive. It's just mm. that's not how it works. No. You know, and and uh, unfortunately, you'll have people arguing about, well, do you do Meisner? Do you do Strasberg? Do you do, uh, you know, what do you do? And you say, well, are you a good actor? You know, do you know mm. what it is to be a good actor? How do you define it? And they're going to say, well, what technique is it? And I say, what, what do you have as a human being? What do you have to say? Because I think good actors have something to say about life. And I don't think that that's political. Mm. It's it may be political in the deep sense of the word, in the sense of you, if you share your humanity, you can touch people, and and that can help them to perceive things in themselves. I think that's what art is about. Mm. What it does, you know. But if you go out to make a point and to you know, hit someone over the head with what they're supposed to be thinking anything you think comes out of things that you feel otherwise it's just intellectual bullshit it's like uh going into i mean when i did my a levels when i was 16 to 18 i mean the three practitioners that we learned was obviously stanislavski brecht and artoed um and that was the only three that we learned. And I saw the uh, the the eye movement then. So if 
I, what what does that say in my uh for that my says position? that that's what they were teaching yeah <laughs> i mean you know the brecht theater was absolutely wonderful mm. and the acting was sometimes so simple that it was more real than most method actors yeah you know uh and uh uh it's very misunderstood because the intellectuals, what they take from Brecht is distancing. They love the word because it means you don't have to feel anything. I'm an intellectual. I can be an artist, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's how they interpret Brecht. That's not what he meant at all. You know, he was really dealing with that he wanted people to see that what was happening to this person was happening because of the world that he was living in. And one of the stories is when, when they were uh, uh, doing Mother Courage, uh, you know, Helene Weigel, who was a great actress, who they were, I don't know if they were officially married, but they were a couple. Um, <clears throat> and in the scene where she, where the son Da is dead, um, she, you know, breaks down she's and brecht is going no no he says he no i don't want that i don't want that i don't want this just personal emotion and she said it's impossible for a mother not to react and they had this argument you know which no one is going to get in the middle of, of a married couple <laughs> arguing uh, and what they ended up with was that she screams, but it's a silent scream. You know, and theatrically, it's absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. And the audience will understand. But if it was just her emotion, then you may get pulled into what she has experienced and not see that this is experienced because of this war that's taking place. And that's what he wanted. He wanted things in, in perspective, which is what he called distancing. And I, 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 I taught a Brecht workshop and uh, what I, and I, I, don't ask me how I came to it, but I, I got an idea to do an exercise. <laughs> and what I, what I did was I asked people to come in uh, with a, and, and to be able to uh, recount a, a traumatic experience in their lives, something that really had really affected them. And then when they would tell it, I'd say, but I want you to tell it as though it happened to somebody else. And so when they would start to get emotional, I'd go, it's not you, it's somebody else. And therefore there would be an emotion, but it wasn't just this, what I'm feeling. It was what is happening to the person. And I thought that it was a really interesting exercise, which clearly demonstrated what he wanted. And if you talk to the best actors in the world, when the character has deep emotion, they're never just going to express all the emotion. Because first of all, you're going to have to speak. Normally, if something like that is happening, you have a monologue that's at least one page long. <laughs> so if you can't handle your voice and handle the emotion, you're not going to be successful. You know, and so, um, you know, uh, emotion is wonderful as long as the actor is the boss. Mm. And I think that that's all that, I think Brecht is fundamentally dealing with that mm. when, when he dealt with actors. And it's very misunderstood because it's taught in an intellectual way. I think the mm. same is true with, uh, I don't know if you know Michael, who Michael Chekhov was, but uh, Michael Chekhov was a great actor who, who uh, wrote one of his, his books. There's a thing in it called The Psychological Gesture, which is really the, it's the chapter I like. You know, in which he says a character has a psychological gesture and there's this search for what's the gesture. You know, like in a Greek tragedy, you, you know, whatever it is. You're on your knees. You know, 
Uh, but it's the essence of life. And I do think uh, art to me is like my, my father would say that that it was theater was heightened reality. And as I matured, I, I didn't really understand heightened reality because I've never seen anything more theatrical than what happens in life. You know, if you put on stage what you see in life, people won't believe it. They'll say you're exaggerating. So I, I've never understood that. And what it is to me is not a heightened reality. It's an essence of reality. It's like a perfume. It's very concentrated. You know, in, in a Shakespeare play, what happens in two and a half hours is just extraordinary if you think about it. And the structure of a Shakespearean play, Hamlet, I think, has somewhere in the neighborhood of 29,000 words. A normal novel has at least 90,000, 90 to 100,000 words. So he, in a third of that, look at the life that's concentrated. And I think that that's really defines what the essence of theater is at its mm. best. You know, uh, normally theater is just a form of entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to know what the difference is. Mm. Otherwise, you don't know really what you're talking about when you try to say it's an art form. People don't have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Final question for you then, uh, John Strasberg. And I've always asked my guests this question, and that is, how do you look back on your career? Well, I don't think it's over yet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer. I love it. Do you know what? A lot of people would always say to me, Oh, that is a good question. Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. But you just put it, you went, Well, it's not even over well, yet. People, are, people have been asking me for 15, 20 years when I'm going to retire. And I'm, I'm going, Don't. <laughs> why do I want to retire? I mean, I kind of like what I'm doing. You know, I go, I know as I get older, you know, maybe I'm going to want to work less. You know, and I've, I'm actually in a period where I'm, I'm not working and I sometimes I'm sitting around and I'm going, you should be doing something. And I go, I don't want to do anything. And I said, okay, so, you know, I've done a lot in my life. I don't have to do anything. Uh, and I'm kind of enjoying that. And that means that I'm, someone will say, oh, are you retiring? I say, no, I'm resting. You know, there's an English expression when actors are not working. You know, which I love because, you know, when we, you know, American, you say, what do you do? I'm unemployed, you know, or, you know, in, a, in New York, the joke is, what do you do? I'm an actor. In what restaurant? You know, it's a, because everybody works at something else. You know? mm. um, but uh, uh, the English would say uh, when they were unemployed, they say, I'm resting. And I love that expression. I thought it was, that's a nice thing to say. So I'm resting at the moment, you know, I'm, I work, you know, I'm, I have, I'm, I'm actually having to deal with stuff because I travel a lot and I just have to organize my schedule. Now it's crazy because since the pandemic, people are traveling and it's just crazy, mm. you know, so we were, you know, normally if I'm going to go to Paris and at the end of January, I don't think about renting an apartment until, you know, September, October. I In June, I started, I just said, well, let me look. And everything that we normally rent was already rented. And I was going, my God, people are just nuts. The people are just crazy. You know, we've been shut up for two years and people are just, you know, I, I'm traveling all the time. You know, so I had to make reservations into the spring. You know, and I'm, and I'm going, I don't want to think about what I'm going to do. You know, years ago, I had the opportunity as a director. I'm a successful director. And and people were asking me about, you know, projects. And I looked at it and I could have planned my life three to five years in advance, uh, which would have really made me you know, more 
I would have made more money. I would have been more known. And I went, well, it's a really interesting project, but I don't know what I want to do five years from now. And I don't know that I want to live my life that way. I'd rather live as close. Obviously, you have to plan. But I don't want to live that far ahead. You know, I want to live in, you know, if I can, I'd live in the moment. Best moments of life I've ever had and the worst moments of life I've ever had. I'm in the moment and I feel more alive. And I would, and I actually, that's what I teach. That's what I share with people, which is very hard because you say, well, how do you make that into a technique? And I say, you work hard and you have to know a lot. And if you know a lot, then you can, you, because you have a form that you're dealing with. Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF 627EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-94248. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film, or even theater. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewelry? Do you want to pick up a hobby, but do not know what to take or where to start, then look no further than the Veil Jewelry Workshops. Veil Jewelry Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewelry. They will help you make a range of silverware, including rings, bracelets, and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills, such as soldering, texturing, shaping, and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewelry, and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789 794248